history and philosophy of Pathfinders. Um, back at Cap Hale, Jeremy mentioned Cap Hale. That was one of our first uh, big, quote, international camperies. Uh, those of us that showed up there early, that uh, were there in the, you know, to set up the whole, the whole site, uh, that the weekend before the Pathfinders came in, they had some workshops uh, going uh, on location. And one of the workshops was this workshop here, which was conducted by Pastor John Hancock, <laughs> who had been our world Pathfinder leader and was in on the ground floor of, of, of Pathfinders. So I took copious notes of his presentation and uh, most of my presentation this morning is off those notes that Pastor John Hancock gave that Sabbath. Uh, there may be some discrepancies based on what you've read about the history of Pathfinders, uh, but they're not major, but uh, much of the history that I'm giving you today really came from the mouth of John Hancock himself. And, and we became friends. We, we were friends at that time and, and became uh, good friends while he was still in, in leadership. In fact, uh, uh, one of his last Pathfinder camperies that he participated in was at our camperie at Gulf States Conference at Camp Alamisco when we were celebrating uh, 40, I think 40 years of Pathfinders. I had him in as, a, as our guest speaker and he came in with his uh, uh, accordion and, and all that and, and just was enthusiastic as he ever was. So that was a real blessing. So history and philosophy of Pathfinders. Um, Pathfinder ministry is everything that's done, everything that's done with the Pathfinders and for the Pathfinders and the church's relationship to, to the family, of course. You know, we ought to keep uh, family in mind and all our Pathfinder uh, planning and, and vision. The community, wherever you belong, it could be the church community, the, the town, whatever it is, the community. And, uh, of course, the world. Those are the handouts. Okay. So uh, we'll pass these handouts. That's what I get for not looking completely in the box. <laughs> sorry, sorry, to interrupt. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so he'll pass the handouts out. But uh, Pathfinder Ministries, everything we do in, in, in the context of, of uh, family, community, and, and the world. Uh, it also goes along with the, the, the text that we find in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is what? Old. Old. He will not depart from it. Now to me, this is a real promise for those of us working with youth ministry and youth ministry, uh, whatever level it is. Uh, we hear so much today about how many young people we're losing to the church. And we are losing more than we should. But this text gives me promise that the ones we lose, at least, at least we think we've lost, will be back. We'll be back. That's why we have Pathfinders, is to uh, hopefully ingrain in, in these young people uh, the values and, and uh, the philosophy and standards of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which we know they will come back to uh, when they're old. Hopefully, hopefully they won't leave. That's another reason we have Pathfinders, is to keep our young people in the church. And uh, we, we know through, through uh, scientific studies and surveys that Pathfinders is a, is a, a real strong element in the church that will keep our, our young people tied to the church. But Proverbs 22, 6 is a key text that we can keep in mind as Pathfinder leaders. When does it happen? When does Pathfinder ministry happen? Um, when Pathfinders live out their faith in the church and community and in the world. When they can live it out and uh, make, make it part of their lives what they've learned in, in Pathfinders. Uh, when Pathfinders and adults together share their faith and life in all areas of church ministry, I think it's important that we, um, we, we involve the Pathfinders in the life of the church, in the leadership of the church, giving them meaningful responsibilities. Um, I still remember uh, vividly when I was a school principal and administrator in, in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, that's where I got my start in, in youth ministry. Uh, there was a nominating committee one year. I was on that nominating committee. And uh, the leader, uh, the youth leader position came up for the church. And I made a big speech 
about uh, what should be happening in youth ministry in the church. I, was, I made a passionate speech. And I said, okay, Bill, you do it. <laughs> I said, okay, I will. That was my start in youth ministry. And part of my job was to oversee the Pathfinders. And uh, we had an evangelistic meeting coming up, and the pastor came to me and said, Bill, we, want to, we need to cancel Pathfinders during the course of the evangelistic meetings. And I said, why? He said, well, you know, we want to give major emphasis to, to the evangelistic meetings and so forth. Well, I understand that, but I said, what message are we giving to our kids when we cancel Pathfinders for evangelistic meetings? I said, what message are we giving to the kids? And so we had a little kind of a heated discussion there. And um, I said, I'll tell you what we'll do, Bob. I said, um, what do you think about getting the Pathfinders involved in the evangelistic meeting? He said, you'll do that? I said, yeah. I said, we can do that as long as we don't cancel our meetings. <laughs> so okay, you can have your meetings. <laughs> and so we got the kids involved in the, in the evangelistic meetings of the church. It was good training for them. It gave them meaningful responsibilities. Talk about meaningful responsibilities. I remember one of my staff members at camp, and I've got two or three here that know who I might be talking about because I work for him at camp, but uh, he, uh, he grew up in... And the church there and, and Gulf States Conference went on to college, became a nurse. And he came back as my camp nurse uh, one summer at camp. And we were talking about his church. And he quit, he quit going to his church, going to some, some other church. And I asked him why. He said, well, they asked me to be a junior deacon. I said, what? He said, they asked me to be a junior deacon. Here was a nurse, grad, college graduate, and the church asked him to be a junior deacon. Well, we need to give our kids meaningful responsibilities. And um, that's part of what Pathfinders is all about. When Pathfinders and adults support and care for one another in Christ. When they can support one another and care for one another in Christ. Pathfinder statement of mission. And uh, I think you have it there in front of you. Uh, in, your, in your handout, uh, Pathfinder Ministries is an organization of the SDA Church dedicated to meeting the social, physical, mental, and spiritual developmental needs of junior and teen youth by challenging the Pathfinder to experience a personal relationship with Christ, having a sense of achievement and responsibility in developing respect for God's creation, including his fellow man. That is a mission statement. And um, if I were a new Pathfinder leader, like many of you are, I'd go into your staff manual and make a copy of that that uh, mission statement uh, and, and have it in front of you have it in front of you so you can constantly refer to it as we keep reminding ourselves why we are doing what we do I know in Atlantic Union we had a mission statement for our youth ministries in Atlantic Union I had that on my desk all the time so I constantly referred to that to make sure we were on target with what we're doing as in youth ministries in the union and we need to do that as Pathfinder leaders as well so if you're a new one, uh, this is a, a good, a good uh, piece of, of advice to you. Um, what are the age requirements of Pathfinders? Six to ten? Ten to fifteen? Grade five through ten. Yeah, basically that's it, grade five through ten. Uh, there used to be a time when we say ten to, you know, thirteen, fourteen. Um, but now it's grades five through through. Grades, yeah, five through through ten, yeah, or twelve. In this conference, is it twelve? Okay, okay. Um, now, when I was Pathfinder director in South Dakota conference, I see you going to Pine Ridge Mission. I know that place very well. Uh, at that time, we we went more in age, you know, ten to, and um, you remember those days well. And in that conference, in that small conference, we had. You know, kids were isolated out in the farms and so forth. And in order for a church to have any size club, you know, sometimes they had to take in nine-year-olds, and I allowed that. And I, my counsel was, if you think a nine-year-old can handle Pathfinders, you know, that's, that's the church's own, own decision to make. But uh, So age requirements, um, you know, you have to go through the approval process as a club and get your certificate from your club. Uh, dedicated to meeting the, the social uh, development of the of the Pathfinder, how do we do that? So we think of the social aspects. 
well, just bringing them together, you know, regular meetings is, is, uh, is bringing them together to develop socially, also to some of the other elements that we plan in the Pathfinder program uh, to provide the social aspects. Uh, the physical aspects, uh, the physical activities that we do, some of the honors that we teach, uh, the mental, of course, the spiritual aspect of, of our Pathfinders. And how do we challenge? We challenge our Pathfinders to, to take what they've learned and go out and, and, and put into practice what they've learned. And, and we need to make those challenges. Sense of achievement, um, the um, uh, awarding of, of honors and, and going through the, the Bible achievement uh, program, friend, companion, and so on. And, um, you know, we always like to, at least we ought to make the investiture time a very special event for the church and uh, make it something that, that uh, will be a memory maker for the young people, investiture. Um, and uh, responsibilities taught and developing respect for, for outdoors, God's, God's creation. That's, that's all part of the, the mission statement. Uh, brief history of Pathfinders. Uh, way back in 1879. Uh, we don't hear Pathfinders back then, but junior youth societies were established in our uh, churches and schools. In 1907, uh, the General Conference voted to establish a, a youth department, and M.E. Curran was the first youth director. In 1909, uh, Meeting Colorado voted a program for junior youth, established uh, JMV societies. And we have the aim and motto uh, developed, uh, aim the Advent message to all the world in, in this generation. It's sad that we've seen many generations go by since this. We need to try to wrap this up, shouldn't we? <laughs> Our motto, the, lo the love of Christ constraineth us. Um, 1919, Arthur Spaulding wrote the first pledge in law. Organized in Nashville, the Mission Scouts. Nashville, Tennessee, Arthur Spaulding. Uh, 1924, uh, Harriet Holt asked to lead Junior Youth Society, a female leadership position in this church, the general conference level. In uh, 1928, 16 honors were introduced. And the JMV class introduced during uh, this time period. In uh, 1925, uh, some more history here. The first summer camp was held in Australia. In uh, 1928, uh, the first summer camp here in the United States was held in the West by Julian Nelson at Angeles National Park. In 1938, the Master Guide Manual was published. Actually, back then, it was a Master Comrade Manual. You've heard it. Remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some of you remember that? My mother was a Master Comrade, and I still have her little Master Comrade booklet in my library, which is, which is very, very special. Um, but going back to the first summer camp, uh, the name of that summer camp, uh, what they call that? Anybody know, know what they called that camp? They called it the Pathfinder Camp. Uh, how did they come up with the name Pathfinder? John Fremont. Yeah, the great Western explorer. And that camp was, was named after John Fremont, the great Pathfinder is what they called him. And so we started hearing the name Pathfinder in our church. In 1920-27, uh, the first Pathfinder Club, uh, as we know it today, tried to start, tried to get their start. And it was, it was led by a gentleman scoutmaster by the name of John McKim. And there was a Dr. Uh, uh, Theron Johnson who offered the use of his home. Uh, the guys, the boys met downstairs and the girls met upstairs. Now, we couldn't get them together then, could we? Uh, boys met downstairs and the girls upstairs. But um, since they had this group of young people meeting, they had no name. So what do we call the club? And already the Pathfinder name was already part of the vocabulary. Uh, you know, with, with the camp uh, situation. So the name Pathfinder Club uh, got a start. But, unfortunately for this group of young people and for these individuals, 
the, um, the uh, older church members of the church uh, had some very serious questions about what was going on in the home of, of Dr. Johnson and this new organization. And they thought that the club activities were bringing the world into the church. This was terrible. And basically the church shut them down. They shut them down back in, in 1927. And we don't really hear about uh, the Pathfinder organization again until after the Second World War, about 1948-49. Well, the type of activities that uh, they, were, they were having in, in uh, the home of, of this doctor, well, they had crafts and they had games and did some nature study, uh, field trips, <laughs> and campouts. So what's new? <laughs> you know, basically we took their template and uh, we have our Pathfinder uh, uh, club uh, today. What were uh, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts? What, what was their original new dates? How you know, they, they, they go back to the 1800s, okay. middle to late 1800s. Yeah. Um, the, um, I don't know, I, I don't think I have this part of the, the presentation, but uh, when, when we started our clubs out in California, when I said World War II, um, they started out really as Boy Scout clubs and Girl Scouts. And, and the, more, the more the individuals back then looked at it, they realized they really couldn't, couldn't adapt all, the, all the, what the Scouts had to offer and so forth. And so they thought it would be better that we go our own way. And they discussed this with the, the Scouts, and they agreed that it would be best for our church to have their own organization. So they said they offered us any help that they could give us. That's why we, you know, you have a lot of comparisons between our uniform and the Boy Scout uniform. We call the honor badges, they call it merit badges. But uh, they, they basically helped us get our, our start. Uh, Lawrence Skinner, some more history here, a North Pacific Union, uh, promoted a trailblazer club. And they de he designed uh, the emblem, uh, much of what we know today, the spiritual, physical, and social the shield representing faith in Jesus Christ, the sword representing the Word of God. And uh, the original uniforms that they had with the Trailblazer Club um, were purchased through <laughs> Army Surplus. <laughs> What's new? <laughs> so now we come to the first conference-sponsored Pathfinder Club um, in Riverside, California. Uh, Mrs. John Hancock designed a uniform for the girls. And uh, the first club was made up of 15 boys and girls. And uh, Lawrence Paulson, who also had a large club in Glendale, helped with the Riverside Club. And uh, he was responsible, really, for organizing and directing 11 different clubs in Southern California back in those days. Um, I look around, I, you know, it's pretty obvious. I'm, there's only two or three of us in here that may remember the early days of Pathfinders. But you remember those days, 19, early 50s? What was our uniform? All khaki. All khaki, yeah. All khaki. All khaki. And the girls' uniforms, remember what those were? Hmm? Yeah. I remember those days. I was a Pathfinder in Orlando, Florida. And uh, then we, we've uh, evolved to what we have today, which I think is much better. But uh, that's uh, basically the basic army type uniform. The Pathfinder song, uh, Elder Henry Berg was asked to write the song in 1949. And he thought of the words uh, driving to a speaking appointment to speak one day, and pull off the side of the road and wrote down the words that came to his mind. I know the Lord was directing him uh, using those words. And uh, he thought as he was writing about the thoughts and the pledge, and uh, he, uh, he was not a musician, uh, and uh, he, his wife uh, helped, helped put the music to the song. And uh, we have the song that we're still using today. Uh, back at Camp Hale, remember, how many were at Camp Hale that are here today? <laughs> remember the, 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 theme, the theme song that we had there? What was it? We were mm -hmm. I was on the, the planning committee at Camp Hale, and, and um, 
my cousin is Jeff Wood, who wrote Side by Side. And uh, I called Jeff Wood and asked him to write the theme song for Camp Hale. And that's what he came up with. And a wonderful theme song. And, and I know there was talk, we need to make that the theme song for Pathfinders. <laughs> and there were a lot of us who said, no, we need to keep the theme song that we already have. But, you know, that's the only theme song in our Camp Reese that kids are still singing. As we are his hands, which goes a, a long ways back. Helen Hobbs designed and sewed the first Pathfinder flag. Uh, Lawrence Paulson designed a series of uh, achievement books. Uh, other important dates that we have here in 1950, the GC adopts a Pathfinder program and emblem, 1950. Uh, 1951. The first Pathfinder Fair was held in Danuba, California. In 1953, uh, we had our first Pathfinder Camporee held at Camp Winnicag in Southern New England Conference. And that was one of my camps up in the Atlantic Union and been there many, many times. And, and right out in front of the lodge, they have a big stone. And on a plaque on the stone is, is uh, commemorating the very first Pathfinder Camporee held at Camp Winnicag in, in uh, Southern New England Conference. And that is the name of the lake. <laughs> a lot of play in those words. Camp win a keg. You know. <laughs> but um, very beautiful little camp up there in, in Massachusetts. And that was where the first uh, Pathfinder Campery was held. In the 60s, uh, we had the regional conferences uh, organizing Pathfinder clubs. In 1970, Danny Davis organized Quote, the very first international camporee held in where? Bermuda. Bermuda. That was part of my Union territory. I had a chance to go to Bermuda two or three times a year. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> Not really. About once a year I was there. A couple times. I know I was down there twice. But uh, very beautiful country. But, you know, we think uh, many times of Camp Hale as the first uh, big, quote, national camporee. But uh, Danny Davis uh, held one that he called an inter international camp in Bermuda in 1970. Then in 1985, we had the first North American Division campery, official campery held at uh, Camp Hale, Colorado. How many were there again? I was there, yeah. Were you there as Pathfinders? <laughs> yeah. You weren't, you weren't the Pathfinder. You were a leader, probably. But uh, we, uh, that, was, that was quite an event there in 1985. And so where was our next one held? A little history here. Where was our next big, quote, national camp re held? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, yeah. Friendship Camp re. Friendship Camp re, uh, Held at Agape Campground in Pennsylvania. I'll never forget that one. Then the next one. Where was the next one held? Red Rocks. A little history here. I'm, I'm giving you a little extra history that nobody really knows. A few people know this. After Pennsylvania, uh, the Canadian Union Conference uh, asked me to go up there and, and conduct a big campery in Canada. And, um, they, they, and at that time, you know, it was, it was thought that we needed to have a major campery in Canada. So um, I was given the invitation to go up to Canada and and uh, put that together. Well, uh, didn't work out. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and um, during this time, Ron Whitehead and I were talking, and and I uh, was trying. We he was trying to keep, uh, you know, trying to keep uh, track of what was going on in Canada with me, and and possibility of Canada doing a, a campery. And and um, we there was a bunch of us in the division that really did what we could to try to make sure that they would have a camp in Canada, but well, I don't need to go into other details. It just didn't happen. And so that's when Ron Whitehead picked up the camp in at uh, Red Rocks. And uh, I keep kidding him. I said, you know, I was responsible for you taking, picking up the camp at Red Rocks. <laughs> Not really, but uh, we've, we've talked about it quite a bit. But uh, uh, that's when Ron picked it up, and, and uh, it was actually sponsored by the, the Rocky Mountain Conference. Um, the division was not involved in the camp. It was more of an invitational. And um, the Rocky Mountain Conference, uh, they, they stood behind the camp financially. And um, it, it did well after Camp Hale, by the way, after Camp Hale. 
I got ahead of myself a little bit. The, the Camp Perea Camp Hale lost a bunch of money. And um, so uh, there was major discussion whether the division could really keep doing big events like this. And that's how Ron picked it up and started going with, uh, with uh, Rocky Mountain. And then, uh, then uh, sponsored by the Center for Youth Evangelism out of Andrews University. So uh, we had Red Rocks. And when was the next camp we held after Red Rocks? Oshkosh, yeah. Remember the theme of, of Red Rocks? Dare to care. Remember the theme for Camp Hale? We had no theme. <laughs> Everybody remembers We Are His Hands, the theme song. But there was no theme at Camp Hale. So um, we had the Friendship Campery, then uh, Red Rocks, Dare to Care. Then what happened after that? Where did we go? Oshkosh. What was the theme for that? No? Discover the power. Yeah. And then uh, where did we go next? Oshkosh. <laughs> and that theme? Faith on fire. And okay, where are we going next? Oshkosh. Theme? Very faithful. Yep. Why have they settled on Oshkosh? Well, I knew that question was going to come up. <laughs> After the first one, actually, after the first one, uh, there was a lot of talk about moving it somewhere else. Uh, people in the in the division wanted it somewhere else, but the uh, bottom line is there's no other place that, that could host what what they had to offer us at Oshkosh. That was the bottom line. I remember taking a trip um, I, out to New Mexico one year, and the Pathfinder Committee voted to look at a place out in, in New Mexico, <coughs> and um, Glorietta. Some of you have heard Glorietta Retreat Center out there. It's a Baptist retreat center, and I happened to be going out that way. And so I said, I'll go up there and check it out. Well, I wasn't there five minutes and knew that we couldn't hold a camper at this place. And uh, so Oshkosh really has given us basically what we, what we really need as far as space and so forth. And, and um, you know, when you look at it, we do this every five years. Uh, we're, you're really looking at a new group of Pathfinders. Leaders may be the same, so leaders will want to change <laughs> sometimes, but they're basically looking at the same group of leaders, different uh, group of pathfinders. Those really were not part of my notes. This was extra on this. I should make it part of my notes. Uh, pathfinder goals, accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. That's the primary goal. Reflect, inter in, reflect internalized Christian values through mature decision-making and behavior. Um, exhibit the righteousness and true holiness and fullness and stature of Jesus Christ. Uh, so important that we exhibit that. And then demonstrate leadership skills, enable empowered to become full partners in active selfless service supporting the mission of the church. Um, that's why I think our TLT program is so important. I don't know how many have TLTs in your club. You doing that toward the coming conference? Yeah, good. Well, we get to that point in time that we, this age group needs to be given meaningful responsibilities. That's why we do TLTs and uh, teach leadership skills. And of course, we have other ways of teaching leadership skills in the Pathfinder Club as well. Um, so those are the, the goals. Pathfinder ministry purpose. To lead membership into a growing, redemptive relationship with God. To lead. To build its membership into responsible, mature individuals. To build its membership into responsible, mature individuals. <clears throat> and to involve its membership in active, selfless service. To lead, build, and involve. And then the next text is what I used last night as my, my uh, major text for my presentation last night. So I, we don't need to spend any more time on that. But um, I hope that, I hope that uh, as Pathfinder leaders, you can sit down with your club and, and look at the, at the five points of this, 
this text and how you can apply them to your, your Pathfinder Club. Might make a major difference as we look at that text, uh, Matthew 28, 12. <clears throat> Pathfinder Ministry Objectives. Uh, the Pathfinder Club will encourage its members to belong to the church, confess their Christian faith, and take an active part in fellowship, worship, outreach, and service. And um, I think it's so important that we have, have these four areas emphasized in our club. That, that brings balance to our clubs. When we look at the fellowship, the social aspect, the worship, uh, the outreach and, and service. Um, I challenge you sometimes, those of you especially, uh, uh, those of you that are experienced Pathfinder leaders, uh, to sit down sometime and, and do a vision with your, with your do a vision uh, pr uh, process with your leaders and look at fellowship, worship, outreach, and service to see how you're implementing each one of those aspects in your club. I encourage youth leaders to do the same thing. And when I challenge youth leaders to do that, you know what comes up the most, the highest activity? is fellowship. <laughs> that's because that's the easiest one to do, a lot. Now, the social activities, but we need, to, we need to bring balance to our Pathfinder Club, and, and if, we, if we bring balance to fellowship, worship, outreach, and service, then you'll have a well-rounded uh, club. Uh, <clears throat> The Pathfinder Club will involve its members as full partners in all aspects of the church ministry to its members, to the community, and to the world. I mentioned to you the letters that I wrote my young people that were baptized. And uh, one of the things in my letter that I said to those kids who were baptized, I challenged them, talk to your pastor. Uh, ask him to put you to work, you know, how, how, you, how you can help him as, as a pastor. We need to involve our young people with with the church. Involve your pastor, by the way, in your, in your club. The Pathfinder Club will challenge its members in the mission and ministry of Christ through the church so that God's words become meaningful and, uh, and fruitful. Pathfinders discovering themselves in the world. Uh, learn Christian values. We can do that through the Pathfinder Law that we we uh, have our, our Pathfinders recite. What is the Pathfinder Law? To keep what? Morning watch? For my body. Go on God's errands. Keep that before your kids. Use the law in devotions and worship. Um, there's two, two or three people here that know this. At Camp Alamisco, uh, I put signs up, like, you know, the Burma Shave signs. As you come into the camp, you'll see the law uh, coming into the camp. I also did that at Camp Yorktown Bay when I was director. I'm the only guy around the division. I know I've done that. <laughs> but uh, the ones at Camp Alamisco are still up. I check them every time I go in there, make sure they're in order and everything, you know. And uh, the ones at Camp Yorktown Bay are not there anymore. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But uh, I, I've had more visitors, especially non Adventist visitors, ask me about that when they come into the camp. What's, what's the signs all about? You know, and I have a chance to tell them what it's all about. <clears throat> need to keep that before our kids. Uh, develop self-discipline. <clears throat> uh, we do that through various classes, marching and drilling, uh, working towards Pathfinder the year and so forth. And don't tell anybody here, but I do not like to march and drill. That's not been my thing in Pathfinders. But it's important. <laughs> it's important. It does teach teamwork and discipline. Um, <clears throat> develop self-discipline through the various classes and, and uh, achievements that we, we have for them. Making friends. Wow. Making friends. What a great way to make friends. Some of these friends they make are lifetime friends when they're making Pathfinders. Um, the adventures that uh, they can go on and enjoy safe and exciting adventures. Um, Campouts, field trips, so forth. Learn about teamwork. Working together as a unit. Again, being part of a drill team, being part of a, a club, uh, the uniform and, and all that. 
That's what teamwork is, is all about. Um, prepare for church and community responsibilities. Uh, in the Gulf States Conference, we developed the, the, the Bald Eagle Award, which I, I still wear in my lapel, the Bald Eagle Award. This is a special award in, in the Gulf States Conference that, that uh, goes above and beyond the Pathfinder of the Year Award. And uh, we have certain criteria, and we challenge our Pathfinders to meet the, the, uh, the Bald Eagle Award. And uh, we, had, uh, we developed a John Hancock Award, which is similar to the award that was just given out today. But we call it the John Hancock. Do they still give that out over there, Christy? I hope so. The uh, John Hancock Award is an award that we give to an outstanding Pathfinder leader in the conference every year at our Pathfinder Fair. Uh, but these are goals, you know, that we, we have our Pathfinders and our leaders can work, work towards. Um, acquire, um, where am I here? Okay, got a little ahead of myself. Acquire hobbies and skills. Uh, teaching of honors, camping and hiking. How many of you can think of something you do today as an adult, maybe a hobby and skill that you learned in Pathfinders? What would be yours, Bill? Backpacking. Backpacking. Okay. What, you, did, did I see another hand here? What was yours? Uh, Cooking, skills. Cooking skills. You know, I never learned that one. <laughs> you teach it. Okay. Any others? Any others? Sewing. You sew? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> That's great. Sewing. I never learned that one either. <laughs> you what? <laughs> fire building. Okay. Uh, just a little side story here. I mentioned fire building. Uh, there's two or three of us. Uh, I came up with, with something new to do at uh, Camp Marie and uh, Camp, uh, Camp in Oshkosh next time is to have a... Um, um, what I would call a vintage campery or a retro campery, is we'd have a site on site that kids could come and participate in some traditional camp ac uh, campery activities like fire building. I'm talking to Ron Whitehead about that already and a couple others up there in the office. We'd have, uh, and Joe White and I are talking, and he wants to be involved if we go this way, but have some traditional activities on site of the campery like fire building and uh, cooking, you know, and, and knot tying and tent pitching and orienteering that we really don't, we haven't had at the campery out there. So uh, I guess in, as far as my, my, uh, my Pathfinder experience, I would think that it's probably all the aquatic stuff that, that, uh, that we, I've earned all my honors in all the aquatic. Growing up in Florida, you know, it's kind of a natural. <laughs> and, um, but those were, come from my Pathfinder days. Uh, grow an atmosphere of love and acceptance. Discover their world and themselves. Learning to accept each other. Learning to get along with others uh, that have been raised differently. Maybe from a different culture, and we see that so much today. Uh, learning to appreciate differences in each other. That's all part of the, the Pathfinder Club. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, native-born American, not native Americans, but those who were born and raised here, there was a time in our society when clubs was a really big thing. You know, you had the Elks Club and the this yeah. Club and yeah. the bowling groups. And, and it seems that American society has moved away from clubbing, mm -hmm. you know, except for bars or whatever. Yeah, uh, glad you threw that in. Maybe shift yeah. to a different kind of clubbing. How does that affect the mindset of Pathfinders and our ability to actually reach kids when we have a model that is still, is kind of set back in maybe the early 1900s, mm -hmm. you know, as far as the uniforms and marketing yeah. and, yeah. you know, and all that. Is, I mean, is it, is it just times, it still appeals to kids or has there been a need to alter uh, or maybe it's been a little more challenging to recruit kids that were born and raised in the United States. Um, well, yeah, I see where you're coming from. I, I think uh, we just all we need to do is look at what's happening. Pathfinders are still growing uh, for some reason. 
<laughs> How is this it's, going among Caucasians and black Americans who were culturally from here, or is it growing more so in the immigrant groups? Um, or both? I say both. I, I think uh, in um, in um, can, can you shut can you shut the camera off for a minute? <laughs> I got to keep remembering that thing's on. I, I think uh, in in the Adventist Church um, in, in in cultural groups, I think we're having a little more challenge with the Caucasian clubs across the board as far as uniforms and things like that. I think with. Um, with Hispanic clubs and, and our, our, our black African-American, or I know I, I saw some African clubs here today. Um, that's not such an issue for the uniforms, but uh, I think we are dealing with some issues with Caucasian. And we're dealing with this across the board in North America. The youth ministry as well, not only Pathfinder, but youth ministry. Uh, we, 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 we are facing some greater challenges with our Caucasian uh, people here in the United States and our young people. But the big, pic the big picture is, <laughs> the big picture is, though, the Pathfinder Club today is, is one of the most stable organizations in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And all we have to do is look at Oshkosh. <laughs> you know, and we're looking at 35 to 40,000 Pathfinders coming into an event like that. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal. It, it is amazing. And, and uh, we could bring in more if we had more room out there. But... Uh, and, and, and we, we as a church, especially the Pathfinders, uh, we have taken some steps to try to bring it to current 21st century things like the, the, the changes in the, in the Bible Achievement Program, you know, the, the friend class, all that, that, uh, those, that class work. There's some been major changes in that, um, which we feel is, is uh, bringing it up to, to where we are today. Um, one of my youth directors in the Atlantic Union, Dan Whitlow, has been on the forefront of, of, uh, of uh, redoing all that curriculum, which we feel is meeting the needs more of our young people today. Uh, we hope to make some major changes in the Master Guide program, too. It's to, that's been a slower process, but bringing that more to the 21st century as well. Because obviously there are some things that are out of date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was... I was riding last week in a golf cart up at Columbia Union Path under Camp Marie with somebody that had a Ph.D. in chemistry, and we were talking about the chemistry on her. <laughs> it's way out of date. Uh, yeah. You know what? A computer on her, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, prob the problem that we're facing in our church is we, we work with volunteers, you know, and it's, it's just a slow process getting some of these changes, yes. Factors are there that affect the country at large and organizations at large yeah. that might be impacted by the Pathfinders Club? Yeah, how yeah. the Pathfinders has been impacted by the cultural change mm -hmm. yeah. among Native, you know, Americans who are second generation or third generation here, uh, because you know the shift has been to less formality. Yeah, you know, you're finding churches moving to less coat and tie and. Yeah. And, and so I'm just curious how yeah. all that works with yeah. Pathfinders. Yeah. I think it's more lax in South in, in Georgia Cumberland than in South Atlantic. Yeah. Because I do work in South Atlantic too. And if, when you have a conference event, you see more uniformity than what you see. In South Atlantic. In South Atlantic. Right. More yeah. More uniformity than in Georgia Cumberland. I spoke to Pastor Swafford last year about um, the inconsistency. Yeah. And um, what, I, what he said was that each club were al was allowed to do to wear with whatever. Yeah. There was no firm uniformity yeah. across the board. That's why when you have a conference event, you see some in pants, some in skirts, you see long shorts, and then that's not looking good. Well, you're right, and, and uh, it's interesting. Okay, five minutes. Uh, I'm overdressed today here in my Master Guide uniform. But uh, if I were attending this event in any of my conferences in the Atlantic Union, all the master guides would be in this yeah. uniform, mm -hmm. especially in Northeastern Conference. Most of the Atlantic Union is immigrants. Uh, well, no, I, no two, I two or three of my conferences up there, predominantly Caucasian conferences, they'd, they'd be uh, in, in this uniform today. I mean, Northeastern, by yeah. large, 
Yeah. It's regional. Yeah. Yeah. But there is more. There is more in the regional conferences around North America. More regimentation. Uh, more. Actually, my shoes that I have on. If I were to wear these shoes in Northeastern, they would not be code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they, yeah, they wouldn't be, I'm, I, I'd be, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be. Right, I the question I have is, is Pathfinder dynamic enough that we can, you know, have a broad umbrella, or is Pathfinders taking a hard line and saying you, and what I hear is that it depends on where you're at. It does, it's a, it's a broad umbrella. Okay. I probably think NAD needs to step up some more and try to have a uniformity across the board. Yeah. NAD is the, is the umbrella for, for the Pathfinder Club. And in, in, in the North American division. So they need, I think it needs to start there where they try to have a uniformity across the board. Anywhere you go, as an Adventist, yeah. when I left Jamaica and, and, and came to New York, I had the same Sabbath school, same quarterly, same everything. Why is Pathfinder any different? Well, we, I've been given five minutes or less now. <laughs> well, uh, the, rest, the rest of my workshop, uh, I do have some slides in the developmental characteristics of Pathfinders. You can, you can read, read, read those. And, and there's some other uh, slides in here on um, how we can implement, how we can apply uh, the, um, you know, going out and, and doing some, some practical suggestions on what we can do in the community. Um, and putting out, getting our pathfinders involved, and then some quotes from, from uh, scripture. And um, I like this one, the results of pathfinder ministry. And I, I'll just uh, mention it here: Galatians 5, 22 and 23. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Ephesians 5, 9. Then Galatians 5. For the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I, we need to, we need to, the result of our Pathfinder Club, we need to see the fruits of the Spirit exhibited in the lives of our, of our Pathfinders. So, um, there you have it. Um, I hope uh, there was some benefit to you, some practical knowledge that you gained, some things you didn't know before. And uh, let's continue making and keeping Pathfinders a strong, strong, strong element in our church for the salvation of our young people. Thank you.